Good afternoon and a warm welcome from me uh, to conference. Um, as John said, this is my first conference um, speaking to you as your Vice President. And what I want to try and do over the next 30 minutes, um, and what I intend to try and do and try is achieve three things. Now, a couple of my NEC colleagues who I thought were friends said quietly to me on the side, Gavin, do you think you might be being a bit personally ambitious? But I want to try and review um, last year's conference, place it in context to what has been happening since in policing. Secondly, uh, highlight some of the key events, I think, that have either affected us um, or contributed to the ever-changing uh, pace of reform in policing and look forward a little bit too. And then thirdly, I want to comment overall on you and your colleagues, the senior operational leaders in the service. Now, my reason for doing this is when I started to think about reviewing last year, um, and don't forget the previous year to that, had seen the, uh, the Olympics, successful Olympics, the Diamond Jubilee celebrations, extraordinary events, uh, commanding extraordinary policing. There's no such thing as an ordinary year in policing, which is probably one of the things which attracts us all here in this room and our colleagues outside this room to be professional police officers. So if you'll allow me, what I want to try and do is subtitle this next 30 minutes as a review of yet another extraordinary year in policing led by extraordinary people, you, the senior operational leaders, who are my colleagues, the superintendents and chief superintendents of England and Wales. Now, there is going to be a participant element to this review. Um, and even at this early stage of conference, um, I'm confident it can be easily achieved. And it's going to mean, on occasions, you having to stick your hand up. But before I begin, can I have a quick show of hands as who's been here to conference before? Who's an old-timer? been here? Good. And secondly, um, who's first time? I think I've probably met most of you at the familiarisation. Good, actually, that's excellent. And then thirdly, is there anybody sat out there in a rather confused state of mind, not sure whether they were here last year, or whether a first time delegate, or even more worryingly, whether they should be down the road at the National Sheepdog Trials, which are taking place today? Um, I, I really hope there isn't anybody here. Um, right, w what's really encouraging is uh, to see so many familiar faces uh, returning to conference, and equally importantly, uh, first-time delegates. And as Irene said, um, also equally important is our exhibitors, um, who are also an important element of our conference too. Please engage with them and have that conversation with them. But the same applies to you, whether it's your first-time conference or your old-time delegate coming, repeatedly coming here. Ask those questions, get engaged, debate, but most importantly, enjoy it. Right, let me begin with last year's conference. And you'll recall, uh, the Commission of the Metropolitan Police, Sir Bernard Hogan Howe, gave our keynote address. Now, amongst the many things which he said to us, he recognised the contribution that you all make to policing each and every day, undertaking 24-hour responsibilities, making life-changing decisions, whether it's a firearms operation, a murder inquiry, or a missing person. He recognised also how incredibly stressful your role is, the pressure and demand from those you're leading, the pressure and demand from those above us. And he spoke also about the work not getting less, which I'll comment upon a bit later, and the demand in experiencing more inquiry and scrutiny. But there's one thing which he did say, which I do wholeheartedly agree with, was to those who consider the service to be the last great unreformed institution. He said nonsense, and I agree with him. A quick show of hands here, please. And I'm going to say this carefully. Anybody not feeling particularly unreformed or has not experienced any change in the last 12 months? If there is anybody, I'd love to know where that nirvana is. OK, right. I, it's, I know it's not that technical, but they do it on question time on BBC. Um, we as a, an association are, as that famous Darwinian quote, is the organisation, I think, most adaptable to change. And to those who raise an eyebrow at that statement, I've got this to say. Don't confuse constructive dialogue and opposing view or simply the offer of an alternative um, as that of an organisation that's not open to change. In fact, your association has been calling for reform and particularly on structures. And in fact, Irene's been talking about that this last 12 months since last year's conference. And we'll touch upon that, I'm sure, um, over the next couple of days. 
Now, I did a quick calculation. How many major inquiries, reform, and legislation have taken place on this service over the last five decades? The acceleration in the last 10 years, and more so, obviously, in the last couple of years. On average, one major piece of legislation has been introduced to this service every year. Our association is not passive to change. Our president, Irene, for instance, has been at the forefront of change, debating over detention and mental health since last year's conference. So let me go back to the Commissioner's comment, which I agree with. I see a service that, despite all the change, is optimistic, is open to change, developing and prepared to challenge itself. And together with the College of Policing, is looking forward professionalise and remain a world-leading service. So, to those who comment, critique and write in this vein outside this room, I've got this to say. Move on, please. You're now starting to cause an obstruction. We then had a session on integrity and ethics by Mike Cunningham, Chief Constable of Staffordshire. Kathleen O'Toole, you'll recall the ex-commissioner of the Boston... Uh, uh, City Police and the Patent Commission, and Dame Anne Owers, Chair of the IPCC. Since last year, still very relevant and very current and very important, and rightly so. But each of them spoke powerfully, and certainly for me, one of the key messages, which is as relevant last year's conference today, is that we must ensure consistency and transparency in how we approach integrity. Kathleen O'Toole, you'll recall, spoke about principled leadership that can usurp politics, a lesson that perhaps we should all remember in this room if required for the future. And Dame Anne Owers, you'll recall, spoke about the fact that integrity and ethic grows from within the culture of an organisation and can't be imposed from outside. Mike Cunningham, Mike Cunningham then referred to the fact uh, that what was clear was that corruption and malpractice was not endemic in this service but that when one small minority uh, lets the majority down, there's invariably a failure of leadership, either to the people we care for and we lead, or to not dealing with the people who've fallen below that standard. I'll move on quickly then to Keith Bristow. If you recall, he came to a dress conference last year, and he was effectively the newly appointed Director General last year. Things have moved on a pace since then. And in fact, the National Crime Agency is being launched officially at the beginning of October. But he talked about a more cohesive approach to organised crime, not just reliant upon that happy accident formed by relationships. Now, it will be different. It won't be a secretive organisation, and it will be a crime-fighting force. And there will be opportunities for colleagues, both superintendents and chief superintendents, in that agency. But more importantly, for us, all in this room and outside, as operational leaders to support the National Crime Agency and work with it. But he also made another important point, I felt. He emphasised the fact that policing is not just about visibility on the streets. It's also about challenging our capabilities of fighting organised crime. The session on adapting to the new policing landscape, Emily Miles, the Director of Policing within the Home Office, spoke about the College of Policing, focus on professionalism, and a change in governance around the election of police and crime commissioners, all of which has happened since last year's conference, and developing a closer relationship with academia and working on a more evidence-based approach to policing. We as an association have been involved in this from its inception, and we've been actively involved since last year's conference. Irene now sits on the board of College of Policing, and I sit representing you on the actual committee um, for the college itself. And you'll recall in that, that session, Ed Boyd from Policy Exchange discussed police and crime commissioners, which I'll come back to again in a few minutes. But he commented about com uh, commissioners not having the luxury of learning from uh, practice from um, previous history, but the story and the benefits of the effect of commissioners will be written by two principal characters, he said. Us, and more importantly, the public. Simon Cole, on this session, spoke about social media, which, again, I'll talk about um, again in a few minutes. But he made one important point. It's an opportunity for us to create a climate of transparency and build on our legitimacy within communities. The session we had about valuing difference, which Irene spoke at and our colleague Paul Symes from Gwent did, was very powerful and, I think, very emotional for those in those room, more so because of Sylvia Lancaster, who you will recall if you were here last year, spoke about the 
um, her daughter Sophie, who was killed simply for being different. And I'll make a bit of a plug here, and I'm not ashamed about doing it. If you haven't already um, uh, done so, visit the sophielancasterfoundation.com website. Um, it's got some good messages, some powerful messages, and I urge you to do so. You'll recall we had a session from Joy Marsden, who spoke about leadership through change, sumo, and that snappy phrase, shut up, move on, which some of you might be um, pleased to hear that I might do in a few minutes. Um, and then we had Damien Green. Now, Damien Green came to talk to us as the policing minister, having only been appointed a week before. Now, putting everything aside, I felt that showed some commitment on his part and some courage too, to come and talk in this room to senior police professionals, only a week having taken up his appointment. And then the Home Secretary talked about reform in policing, but she did say one thing, which I'll come back to. And she said, I quote, I believe the British police are the finest in the world and will remain so. Louise Casey gave our annual lecture. Um, an individual, if you know her, she's very, very passionate. And she spoke about troubled families, partnership, and early intervention subjects which Irene has been very vocal on in the last 12 months and which we have continued to work on as an association. Right, I'm going to pause here for a minute and then move on to what I think are a few events worth highlighting that have occurred in policing over the last year. No particular order, no particular um, order of priority or importance. We've had the elections in November of Police and Crime Commissioners. However, this change in our governance has yet to develop, and whilst there's been much media coverage, I don't believe that those who put themselves forward and got elected as commissioners, um, um, who got elected as commissioners, are as committed uh, as us, uh, are as, as committed as we are to serve and protect the public. I had to get that right for a minute. Um, but I have two points to make in, re in relation to that. Firstly, the ideal that they're visible and a voice for communities is a good one. But there will come a time when the public and us will need to see a difference. And secondly, how long and sustainable can the stock phrase, it's early days, isn't it, uh, be a, an assessment, a current assessment of this policy and reform? On the 1st of October last year, April Jones, a five-year-old girl from a small community within David Paris Police, had been abducted. I'm not going to rehearse the awful circumstances of this evil crime, but you'll recall a huge media interest and subsequent police investigation for the search for April. This was a large-scale operation for what it was a relatively small force. But what struck me in those early days was the professionalism of two of our colleagues, Reg Bevan and Ian John, who fronted the media and were involved. And subsequently, a further colleague, Andrew John, who was a senior investigating officer in that inquiry. And whilst I accept there were many other officers involved in that uh, critical incident, including chief officers, I felt Reg, Ian and Andrew uh, epitomised what it was and what it is to be a superintendent in this service. On the afternoon of the 22nd of May, as John has just mentioned, Drummer Lee Rigby, of the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers, was attacked and killed by two men near the Royal Artillery Barracks in Woolwich. A callous and evil act that reminds us all in this room that the fight against those intent on radicalism and terrorism within our communities must continue. This tragic incident did, however, highlight to me a challenge for all of us in this room and outside as leaders in the 21st century. Because for those members of the public who had witnessed this incident, they had become instant freelance journalists and evidence gatherers, reporting images from the scene of the attack to news media and online social networks via their mobile devices. Now, as well as demonstrating courage at the scene, I think those members of the public were, in my view, balanced and mature in their comments and reporting. However, the incident quickly became subject to online debate, which is healthy in a democratic society, but then was quickly taken over and joined by violent extremists from all sides who were pushing their warped rhetoric and ideology. It's evident that we can continue when dealing with such incidents to see instant images reporting on, online as we're actually dealing with it. Now this will provide opportunities for extremist groups and individuals to espouse their views, to take that space provided by social media and by those whose intentions are to divide communities 
rather than unite them at times of crisis. I suggest to you in this room that the challenge for us is not only dealing with that critical incident, but with others, and including communities in the future, thinking how we're going to ensure and deal with that online space and that the voice of reason takes prominence over the voice of hatred. Social media and technology will present both opportunities and challenges to us in policing as society and communities continue to develop uh, and influence how we live in this century. More people in many countries uh, follow their public institutions and parties than there are actually members. Google has over 100 billion searches a month. So where were those questions being asked before Google existed? I believe that we will soon need to rethink and redefine what we mean as neighborhood and community and develop a paradigm shift in this century that will be our presence and our means of engagement and protecting citizens in the future as we do now in the contemporary. Let me move to a slightly different tack. Having been confirmed, Tom Windsor uh, took office in October last year as Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Constabulary, the first person to be appointed who had not come from an operational policing role in its history. Contrary to some opinion, the world did not stop. Tom now leads an HMIC that is both independent from the Home Office and government. And the fact, in my view, he took some months to talk to people in the service and engage with the people in the service showed somebody who was measured and wanted to think through how he was going to take on that important role. And equally important, have a voice in what are sometimes contentious issues, uh, such as operational independence and accountability, where I heard him talk at the John Harris Memorial Lecture this year. Tom, you're very welcome to our conference, and I'll be very interested to hear what you have to say in your keynote address. I'd also, as Irene mentioned, um, like to welcome our Scottish colleagues and again remind us that in April this year they moved to a single service. A development we as a, an association are keeping a very keen and close attention as four structures is a topic which we are pursuing actively. Irene's mentioned this but I want to talk about it too. Sadly, yet again, we've seen violence, mayhem, intolerance, hatred descend onto the streets of Northern Ireland by a mindless minority bent on anarchy. Once again, our colleagues from the PSNI and this time colleagues from the mainland were in the middle. To a police officer on the line, it's not a matter of consideration as to who's actually thrown the brick, petrol bomb or missile. They've stood literally between anarchy, protecting the vast number of people who want peace and prosperity. To our colleagues in the Superintendents Association of Northern Ireland, we stand with you and can only admire the professionalism and courage you and your officers have shown with our colleagues from the mainland in the recent past. Thank you. <laughs> right, I'm going <laughs> to pause here a little bit. You're going to have to indulge me for a few minutes now. Um, I want to talk about the Tour de France. Some of you will know that I'm uh, an enthusiastic amateur cyclist, and I'm also one of uh, many who are a member of what I would like to call that elite sporting social demographic labelled mammals, middle-aged men in lycra. I've, I'm talking about this because I know you've had lunch, but there is a reason why I wanted to be a little bit self-indulgent and talk about the Tour de France because um, I believe that we can learn some lessons from British cycling. I believe we can learn from their experience and the approach by Sir David Brailsford, Performance Director for British Cycling. He introduced a leadership strategy called Marginal Gains, all about that 1%. On their own, makes little difference, but when you put those marginal gains together, they make the difference between gold and silver and winning and losing. He's looked at the, the, the world outside cycling for inspiration, knowledge and insight. He brought commitment to raising self-awareness and knowledge about what it takes to succeed in learning the lessons from others. He engendered that strong team ethic that took prominence over egos and personal agendas and kept that pursuit in mind around that single team goal, which has resulted prominently in the last two Tour de France being won by Bradley Wiggins and Chris Froome. 
My question is, are we as a service, are we, our colleagues, our partners, everybody engaged in the service, have the single team goal? Because I detect at the moment the narrative being very localised and there's not a lot of narrative around the good of the service as a whole. The second point around his approach was using performance data, not just a straight numerical statistical interpretation. He actually took the context of that data and asked those questions, <coughs> why and how. He's led the team to numerous successes in the 2004, 2008 and 2012 Olympics and GB Cycling is the most successful track cycling team in modern history. The question I pose to you in this room is can we ourselves as a service, raise our self-awareness and take lessons and learning from those outside? I'll leave you to ponder on that question. Right, I want to move to my third point, which is you. Superintendents are leading. You're making decisions every day that protect the public. These are, to anyone else, extraordinary, but to us, all part of the role of being a superintendent. In the DNA fabric policing. Members of this association are running homicide investigations, major public events, public disorder, <coughs> delivering policing to our cities, towns and communities. We're managing and needing change within our individual organisations. We devise strategy, we implement and we're delivering strategy. We're not desk-bound managers or an easy, unimaginative means of cost reduction. We're senior operational leaders. We've experienced a 20% reduction in our membership, and it's evident that our roles are becoming broader and deeper in responsibility and demand, yet we continue to lose more members. Those that report and comment on policing don't see the authorising officer signing off a high-risk complex surveillance authority, or having to balance, in some cases, life-at-risk decisions in a covert policing operation or assessing silver and gold command in the deployment of armed officers in our communities. They don't see the long hours, the commitment and passion. Well, I'm going to pause here for a moment because you've heard enough from me. Um, let's hear what some of your colleagues say about the role we undertake every day. There is no such thing as an all day for a chief superintendent. There certainly isn't a normal day for a superintendent, especially uh, for myself, who, who runs a, uh, a busy inner London borough. Well, my day starts really as soon as I get up. Uh, I'm usually up by about six, half past six, and the first thing I do is switch on the Blackberry and see what's happened overnight in my borough and then the whole of the force. It could be anything from meetings to uh, interviews to um, strategic responsibilities and, and, and forums to attend. If I could best describe my job, I would compare it to a Quentin Tarantino film where no two days are the same, a constant theme that runs through each day, through each week, through each month, such as performance and partnership working, yet the challenges that I face each day are hugely different and massively diverse. Um, I look at domestic terrorism, intelligence gathering to prevent it nationally, and depending on what the prevailing issues are of the day or the week before, depends on what the demands placed on my unit are. Liaising with my four chief inspectors, specifically around comms, custody, crime bureau and firearms licensing, uh, and then dealing with any issues that arise in those areas. That will normally take half an hour on a good day. Uh, an hour if I'm having a grumpy morning with things that haven't gone quite right, I would then move straight into my custody suite where I do a review of all the prisoners that are in custody, all the ones that have been in custody for the past 24 hours, and again, to make sure that we're investigating them properly, that they've got the correct resources, and wherever possible, a big thing of mine is that we send people to court in custody. First thing is overnight emails. Then I review the overnight performance, looking at our, uh, the numbers of crime and any particular critical in incidents. A couple of years ago I was given the job of being in charge of Westminster Abbey for the wedding of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. Um, I think of all things that I've done in my career, this really exemplifies the range of skills you need as a superintendent and chief superintendent in the police force. I then from that meeting went into a partnership meeting with my uh, community safety partners to discuss serious acquisitive crime. Um, it was something like a 16 hour day plus 
Um, I recall it because I remember leaving the house early hours of the morning and making the schoolboy air and saying to my wife, of course I'll be home for my son's birthday that day, don't worry, I won't be late. We've come off the back of a very busy period with G8 in Northern Ireland and spending a lot of time in Northern Ireland, going back and forth with my team, supporting their operation, straight back into the UK, supporting the Badger Cull in the southwest of the UK, completely different again from um, G8. And then in the evening, it was about eight o'clock, I then had a gang meeting in relation to a critical incident that had happened in relation to one of my high profile gang nominals. So that's quite a busy day and probably a normal day for me. We all know you just can't select someone off the shelf to come and do the role of superintendent or chief superintendent um, in policing. This is a role you grow into and are trained to do over a long period of time. A long journey of learning and knowledge and experience which was probably found at the very beginning, those very early days. It's the ability to, without a doubt, deal with um, ambiguity and complex issues, being able to have strong communication skills. Your leadership is absolutely key and fundamental and your core values that shine through and what it is that we do. But also you have to be able to grip the operational uh, challenges that are presented to us every day. I think back to when I joined and it was, I wanted to help people and that's still the case. And it's, for me, it's about me and my team delivering a really good service. Justice for victims and bullying is just what I see criminals as, nothing, nothing more, nothing less than just bullies. And I feel that we are actually that last line of defence. I get still and always will a tremendous amount of pride by putting on my uniform, being out there and representing the police and doing the things that the public want us to do. The diversity of the role, whether it's dealing with a, a personal welfare issue and, and supporting that individual and that family back on its feet, or whether it's dealing with a command issue, or the critical incident. There's been an enormous amount of change over the years, especially recently, but it all goes back to the beginning. It all goes back to why I joined, and that was to make a difference. And if I can make that difference, and I can see that difference, I can see you've made a difference to someone's life, that's good enough. Well, I'm very grateful to um, my colleagues who took the time and trouble out of what were, I know, very hectic schedules to support me in doing that. And I wanted to do that, to really just to reinforce what the role you do every day, day in, day out. And I'm sure everybody in this room can relate to what our colleagues said in that piece. Um, but I have a few more things to say before I finish. We're awaiting the results of the consultation from the Home Office on direct entry. Ireland will comment on our concerns. And whilst we are open to change and innovation and professionalism, I have a few things to say. This is not a game. It's not a 45-minute TV series. We lead real people dealing with real-life tragedy, evil and chaos. We know what it's like, the multiple casualty incident, the dead body from a violent death, looking into the eyes of a parent with a missing child, and experience that slight knot in the stomach when you're managing and leading operational risk and making those decisions most people could not, where there's no second chance if you get it wrong. We know even within that hour or even the same day to switch from managing people, budgets, partnerships and performance. We manage risk. We do it from our own training, development, and as we've seen in that piece, our own experience as police officers, having been involved, learning, and yes, making mistakes in high-risk operations, critical incidents, and policing events as junior officers. So, in conclusion, as I mentioned earlier on, it's time, as Sumo tells us, for me to shut up, move on. But I want to give you, colleagues, yet another extraordinary year in policing by you, extraordinary leaders, as the Home Secretary said last year, in the finest police service in the world. Thank you. <laughs>